worship this morning. Some of you guys have been away. Hope you had a great time. And some of you are visiting for the first time. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Can always tell when uh, adult children and grandchildren are here, not just because there are little ones running around, but because the faces on the grandparents' face get, I mean, the looks just light up, right? It is, uh, it's a privilege to be together today and worship the Lord. And uh, I want to, now even though we're going to talk about it, I want to wish all of you who are fathers, either biologically or through adoption or just in caring for others through the love in your heart. Happy Father's Day. Yes. Happy Father's Day. Celebrate you today. Thank you for what you do. We're going to talk about Father's Day today. And as I've been thinking about and reflecting on what does it mean to be a father? What does what are the roles, maybe, that fathers carry? There's lots of them, but if you can boil it down, what, what would be two of the things, or just a few of the things, that you might say, anybody, pretty much, if you ask them, what does a father do for the family? What are the responsibilities? What are the, what are the first couple of things that might come to your mind? Now, the, the, the risk at asking a question is that the answer you give may not fit with the one I was thinking of. So this morning, instead of asking a question, I'll just tell you the first two things that came to my mind when I thought about, what about dads? What about fathers? What do they do for us? Or what do we think of when we think of fathers? And I think, I think protection and provision. Now, I don't mean protection like we live in the, in the Wild West or, or in, in some uh, remote place where you're literally having to fend off enemies regularly. But there is a degree in which the family depends on the father mm -hmm. to provide protection and certainly provision in all sorts of ways. And we're going to hear about some of those this morning. Let me invite you to open your, your Bible, if you have it with you, uh, a hard copy or through electronic means to the Gospel of John. We're looking this morning at a number of places in John, so just be prepared to flip back and forth, however you do that. Uh, we're going to be looking at John 4 to start with. In particular, I'm going to start reading at verse 46. This is a story that maybe you've heard about before. This is a story of one of the many stories that the different gospel writers recorded of, of Jesus interacting with people in just the comings and goings of life. Some of those are uh, what you might call minor instances. Some of them, like this one, and I don't think anybody would call minor. It's a, it's a major incident in the life of, of the individual we're going to hear about, a royal official, as a matter of fact. Jesus had, had been ministering up in the area of Galilee. This was an area north of Jerusalem, north of the center of the, the, the Jewish um, religion. Uh, and, and in a lot of ways, they thought of Galilee as kind of a, an area of, of mixed religious beliefs. Um, there was some suspicion from the Jewish leaders as they looked toward Galilee. Nevertheless, that's where Jesus did a lot of his ministry. And in this particular case, it says, starting in verse 46, once more he visited Cana in Galilee. You may remember on his first visit, as recorded in John, the first uh, visit to Cana is where Jesus performed his first miracle. Do you remember that? Uh, the wedding at Cana, where they, uh, the young couple risked real embarrassment when they ran out of wine and Jesus stepped forward and turned the, the water into wine there and provided for them. But in this case, he's returned to them to continue his ministry. It says once more, he visited Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. That was a town in, in the Galilean area. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, south of there, the area where Jerusalem is, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. So you know already that this is a serious incident. You fathers in particular, not that your mothers wouldn't also, but think about it. If your child was, was so sick they were nearing death, particularly in a day and age where you didn't have the conveniences and luxury, frankly, of all the medical uh, technology and, and medication, et cetera, that we have available to us today. This would have been a grave concern. And this official obviously had heard about Jesus. And so he goes to beg him to come and heal his son. 
You would expect when something like that happens, particularly today, I think, well, what happens if you rush to the emergency room? You know, you're, you're, you're frightened and you, you go running in, you know, and immediately, I mean, nobody has to say what's going on. They know uh, there's an emergency and, and you're, you're expecting people to hop, jump, respond quickly, right? I mean, if you show up at an emergency room, you're there because you need urgent help. And instead of that kind of reaction from Jesus, you get these cryptic words, this kind of a strange response. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you'll never believe. You think, wow, what a harsh response from Jesus. I mean, here's this father, right? And his son is about to die. He's close to death. And you get this, this response about belief. And obviously the implication is, you all don't believe unless you see more signs and wonders. Now you have to understand a little bit about the context. You'd have to understand a little bit about what Jesus has been facing. And even before Jesus arrives on the scene, what has been happening in the area. And I'm not going to go into a lot of that today. But to say that one of the things that the writer of John was really concerned about was presenting Jesus as the Son of God. And the way in which he did that was to emphasize the work of God, the power of God, as conveyed through signs and wonders. Okay, so that's a little bit of the context behind this. And the people of God were expecting to see signs and wonders when the Messiah came, when the Son of God would appear. They were looking for signs and wonders. It's a little hard to believe that just any old teacher, any rabbi, who is saying some of the things Jesus is saying would be true, would be credible, would be real, unless there were signs and wonders. Demonstrations of power. Jesus is criticizing them for that. He's, he's calling them, in fact, to greater faith. And he's not so much speaking just to this individual as he's, he's speaking to all of those around the crowd that had gathered. The royal official, as you might imagine, doesn't say, oh, in his mind, I'll get back to my son later. Let's enter into this debate and let me explain why I have more faith in this guy's giving me credit. Like we might do if somebody challenged us. He immediately comes right back to the issue that brought him there in the first place. And he says, the, ro the royal official says, sir, come down before my child dies. Sir, hear the emotion. I'm not arguing with you. I'm not putting up a defense. Sir, please, just come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. I don't know how you take that when you hear it. Obviously, a, a bit of a reversal, a bit of a change in Jesus' response. He meets the need, even though this man, we have no reason to believe, was recognizing Jesus as one who could heal over distance. You know, we take that today, those of us who are Christian, those of us who have experienced the power of God through the Holy Spirit. We would expect... If I pray here for someone living in states several away, that the power of God can still heal. But in that day and age, they were far more used to the presence, the up close personal presence involved in healings. And Jesus responds, go, your son will live. Scripture says the man took Jesus at his word and departed. That's interesting since Jesus has just said, what about your faith? Why do you people always need signs and wonders? The man took Jesus at his word and departed. And while he was still on the way, his servants met him with news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday, this is obviously the next day, yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. 
Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. Now again, it's helpful to remember that in that culture, it was often the case where the, the husband, the father, the, the head of the household, if they accepted and believed, that that was an influence on the whole house. The whole house would, would it likely have followed. But nevertheless, this one event, this strange occurrence of long distance healing has occurred. And not just a healing, but life, life restored, so to speak. I look at that on Father's Day and I, I think to myself, Jesus came to reveal the Father to us. Jesus came so that we could get to know God personally. Jesus came to correct some of the misunderstandings of the teachers. But most importantly, he wanted to reveal God to God's people as Father. A very personal relationship. The personal relationship that God had, the Father had with Jesus, Jesus had with the Father. But also to extend that to all who would believe in him, that we might get to know God as Father too. You look at this story and, and maybe you ask yourself, wonder what changed in that man. Wonder what made that man all of a sudden believe, <coughs> take Jesus at his word. I wonder today, if something like this were to occur, what would it take for us to believe? Now you might say, well, most of us, maybe all of us in the room already believe. Okay, so then what might it take for you to deepen your faith to this level of trust? It's simply a word from the Lord Maybe through a pastor, maybe through a Christian brother or sister, a friend. What would cause you to believe in such a way that your faith would bring about the answer to your request? If you'll flip with me over to chapter 5, John continues to tell about the events that Jesus is, is doing. Excuse me, chapter 14. And at this point, Jesus' disciples, those closest to him, have learned that Jesus is going to die. Jesus has predicted his death. He has told them that he's going to leave them. And 14, we commonly know as the chapter where Jesus comes alongside, he begins to tell his disciples not only what's going to happen to him, but what's going to happen to them. Again, he's compassionate toward them. And he begins by saying, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Again, Jesus' message is consistent. He's trying to get the people, the hearers, whether it's the crowd, whether it's a, an individual with a particular need, whether it's his own disciples, to understand this intimate connection between God, who Jesus calls Father, and them. So he's telling his disciples, look, believe that I am who I say I am. He continues in this passage down in verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, which he's promised he'll do, then I'll come back that you may also be where I am. And then he says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. Jesus was speaking to them about the future, but he puts it in terms that sound like he's going to give directions. And he continues after Thomas asks the question, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to know the way? Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. 
it was a striking statement to make because he's in effect saying what we already know, but I want you to try to grasp what was happening then. Jesus is saying the Father and I are one. If you know me, you already know the Father. In other words, I am the Son of God. I am who I've said I am. And if you will look at me and listen to me and follow me, then you'll understand who the Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, this is to Jesus' closest disciples. Imagine those of us who have been walking with the Lord for some time. Walking with the Lord in the sense of believing in God. Trying to follow His teachings. Trying to be good moral people. Trying to live our lives in a way that are respectable. But let's be honest, how many of us struggle from time to time to understand who God is? In particular crises. Or where God is. What's He thinking? What is He wanting me to do? What do I need to do to bring about the help that I'm asking for? Why is he waiting? Sometimes it's an issue of direction. You're trying to figure out God's will. What do I need to do? How do I, how do I get God to give me the direction that I need? And Jesus is saying, if you know me, you know the Father. For the two of us have such a relationship that if you've seen me, You've seen him. Now at that time, they didn't have the New Testament written as we do, and we can study it for ourselves, but they didn't have that benefit. And you can imagine Philip saying, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Just show him to us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who's seen, who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And then he says this. And I want you to pay attention to this because this may be for us today or maybe in, in the future an answer to your prayer when you're trying to discern, when you're trying to understand where is God in the midst of all of this. After asking, don't you believe that I'm in the Father and He is in me? He says, the words I say to you, the words Jesus is speaking, the words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. This is an intimate relationship. The Father and the Son are so like-minded in purpose that what Jesus is saying are actually the Father's words. And what He is doing is actually what the Father is, what God the Father is doing. I make such a point of this because just as that Father who was desperate for help from God came to Jesus asking for Him to heal, just as as that father was crying out to God, but he's asking Jesus right there in front of him, come and heal. Jesus is saying that if you're in touch with me, you're in touch with God the Father. You don't have to wonder about what his plans are if you understand me and what I've taught you. So how does that speak to us? Since I'm assuming most of us already believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all one God. When we're asking for direction today, when we're praying about some decision we're struggling with, when we don't really understand where we're headed or how to handle a particular crisis or situation in our lives that is beyond our control, I wonder if we turn to Scripture to find the answer. I wonder if we turn to the words of Jesus and the Gospels to try to better understand who God is and what He's already taught us. I wonder if we allow our faith, our belief, our understanding of the way the world works, really, to be informed 
by Jesus' teachings? Or do we instead simply turn to the Bible when we need a specific detail answer, a particular answer we're struggling with? Or we, do we turn to the Bible when, when we go to Bible study and we're trying to learn more about a particular book? Do we turn to the Bible at all? When we are faced with a real crisis, a real need, do we pull out our scripture, our Bible, believing that the words of Jesus are just as true today as they were then? Do we read them to understand the mind of God? Do we search here Believing that God will not only answer us and direct us, but he'll meet us in his word. In some ways, this is a very basic teaching. In some ways, I suspect this is not new news. But as I reflect on where we are as a people today, and how many times I hear from different individuals in lots of different places. I just don't, I just don't know the way forward. I don't, I don't understand what God wants me to do here. I'm really struggling with it. I don't understand why he won't do this or why he has done that. If he would just show me, if he would just speak clearly, and I have to wonder today, we don't have the physical presence of Jesus standing in front of us like they did. But we have the words that he spoke. Amen. And if we viewed these words as just as good as hearing from him in person, would it have a different impact on us? Would we begin to live in a different sort of way? Would we approach the challenges that we know are coming by seeking Him in His Word? But would we also respond when a crisis hits? Praying and searching the Word. Asking God to meet us and reveal to us just as He revealed to them through the physical presence of Jesus. We often, I think as people, seek God out in crisis. Maybe even if our faith is just sort of in the middle of the road. When a real crisis hits and it's beyond anything we can do to solve it, we go looking for God. There's no doubt about that. We may have tried everything we know to do ahead of time. We may have called on the different professionals that, that specialize in the area of need. But eventually, if the need's not met, we often go to the Lord in prayer. Sometimes that need is regarding a real crisis, health crisis, like is given to us in that example. But sometimes it has to do with the life or death of a loved one, a child, a parent. Sometimes it has to do with major, major decisions that we have to make that are going to affect not just us, but our whole family. Do we understand the God we worship today to be just as involved and just as capable and just as interested as if Jesus was standing here right in front of us? I have often sought counsel from my dad, and my dad's still living today. I've often sought counsel from my own dad when I had a major life decision to make. And I realize that for many of you, your situation, either your father is no longer living or your relationship with your father is not like the one I'm describing with my dad. But I have, I have gone to my dad because I know my dad has a lot of wisdom. I know my dad has a lot of understanding about how things are done in the world. I know he has a lot of experience and he can often guide me, but he can also point me in the direction to others that might give me help. 
I have counted on him over the years because his advice has proven true so many times. I go to my dad when I have these major decisions because of the proven relationship and the effect it has had on my life. Friends, if we knew Jesus intimately through the study of his word, if we knew Jesus intimately through prayer, seeking him regularly, not just for a need at the time, but just trying to get to know him, if we knew him that well, how would it change our confidence in him when we go in prayer in a real crisis? How would it change our decision-making process when we have to make one of those major life decisions? I wonder if we would have such confidence that when we come to his word and we read in that moment of crisis and we seem to find an answer that says, if you'll believe, if you'll trust me, I'll meet you where you are. If we would walk away as that father did, knowing that he will. I want to encourage you fathers today to seek Jesus like that man did. I want to encourage you to go to Him in prayer and go to Him in the Word trusting that He's listening. Trusting that He has the ear of the Father. Trusting, as we now know, that His Spirit living in us has the power to do anything anything maybe not the way we're expecting maybe not the way we're wanting but if we go and lay our request before him and asking him to do what only he knows is best could we would we walk away with the confidence that our prayer has been answered I ask that to you fathers today because it will make a difference in your life when you go to sleep at night. I ask you as fathers today because you probably know the stats so I didn't bother looking them up today. Fathers have a major influence on their families. What they believe, what they teach, how they act, what they show their families. And to have a father figure in your life who is this intimately familiar with the Lord, this intimately comfortable with Him, this tight in relationship, that whatever you ask that father figure, when he says, I'll go to the Lord on this, you can trust that He is. And that what he tells you is informed. That relationship for a family to have with a father figure is huge. Look around us today at the breakdown in our society. How many people don't have such a father figure to go to? What difference would it make if they did? What difference would it make in your own life? So fathers, I, I thank you for what you're doing for your families. I thank you for the way you stand in. I thank you for the desires in your heart that are noble and right and true. And I encourage you today to not underestimate your influence, your potential influence on your families. And not to underestimate the change in that influence if you pursued your own relationship with the Lord to be this close.
Lord, I confess to you.